Now, within the Tibetan tradition, within the Tibetan tradition, there's many great masters that through meditation, through higher states of mind, through higher states of consciousness, they are able to give us various methods that are unique to us to help us overcome daily obstacles, to help us overcome karma, to help us mitigate karma, and to make our sufferings less, or even in some cases, change. So there are definitely those kind of lamas. These lamas have existed before in India. They have existed in Tibet now. And they exist in many, many um, places where people have attained higher consciousness due to meditation. Tibetan lamas can give us very unique methods to help us overcome problems, to mitigate karma, and to create a new direction, inside, outside. The important thing is that we practice those methods consistently. Not for a few months, and then we stop. A few days, and we stop. And then we start again. And then we have a lot of um, excuses to ourselves about we have a dinner, we have a movie, I'm sleepy, I have to wash the dishes. You know, a lot of small, tiny excuses we give ourselves, which actually is laziness. All of us are lazy. We're not bad, but all of us are lazy. And laziness comes from habituation, and laziness comes from not knowing the value of the practice that we are doing. So therefore, consistency brings results. Consistency brings results anything in life, whether it's materialistic, whether it's secular or spiritual. Without consistency, that secret ingredient of consistency, we can be given the most powerful meditation and mantra from our teachers that Buddha has ever taught, but it will, it will not bear any results if we do not do it consistently. We can have the best spouse in the world, but our marriage won't work out if we're not consistent and keeping that going. It's not, if we, it, you know, whatever we do, if we're going to go to school, if we're going to do work, if we're going to create something, art, if we're going to trek Mount um, Kalash, whatever we want to do, if it's not consistent, it won't bear results. If it doesn't bear results, then after a while, when we do things, we give up, we do things, we give up, we do things, we give up. We have a lot, a lot, a lot of guilt we have a lot of excuses and we have a lot of justifications to ourselves. You see, it's one thing to justify to others and explain things to others. They may or may not believe that's, not, they may or may not believe that's not important, but it's about ourselves. It's about we know that we weren't consistent. And then it's one inconsistency over another, over another, over another, which doesn't bring a lot of results in life. So what's important is that we have to f face ourselves. We have to be honest with ourselves and we have to overcome ourselves. We have to face, overcome, and be honest with ourselves. If we're not consistent, we won't get results. If we don't get results, when karma opens up, we have to experience that karma. We have to experience it. Nobody else will. We have to experience it. So therefore, therefore, you can be in a boat. If it capsizes, some people have the karma to drown. Some people don't, but it's the same boat, it's the same ocean, the same lake, the same situation. Everybody has their own karma. That's not a very pleasant example, but it is, it is an analogy. Now, within the Tibetan tradition, one of the ways to get assistance for what we wish to accomplish in life, what we wish to accomplish that's positive, what we, what we wish to accomplish that maybe is necessary for us, our families, our future, is invoking on the power, the intercession of spiritual beings. Spiritual beings whose abilities to intercede, to help, is way beyond our personal abilities. 
spiritual beings who have clairvoyance, spiritual beings that have compassion, spiritual beings who have wisdom and skillful means that when we invoke upon their power, we invoke upon their compassion, they are able to effect a change in our situation, in our lives, in our mind, even in our environment. How is that possible? That's possible when we have positive karma to support the presence of a powerful spiritual being in our lives. So therefore, within Tibetan Buddhism, there are many types of, of powerful beings. There are the Buddhas themselves. For example, we have Buddha Shakyamuni, we have Tara, we have Marichi, we have, for example, Makala, and so on and so forth. Even in Tibet, some of the high meditators and lamas have connected and contain the power of mountain deities, deities or devas that have been around for thousands of years, hundreds of years, who have power. And they're able to contain, tap into, and invoke this energy. So the spiritual beings that we can contact to help us can be of the enlightened nature, or they can be of the unenlightened nature. The unenlightened nature can be positive or it can be negative energy that has been contained and forced to do positive. So therefore, um, there are many types of spiritual beings that the Tibetan Lamas tap into. They can be mountain deities, devas, nature beings. They can be uh, protective. Uh, they can be people who are very powerful in life, who have passed away. They can be protectors. They can be Buddha emanations. They can be Nagas. They can be spirits. The Tibetan Lamas have tapped into this energy um, because it's present, it's there, and sometimes it's in front of you. So therefore, there are many texts and scriptures that are written on tapping into these energies to help us, into these spiritual beings. So, Within the Tibetan, let's not go to the lower spiritual beings, let's go to the higher ones. Within the higher spiritual beings, you have two types. You have spiritual beings or protectors or protectors that are enlightened and not enlightened. The enlightened protectors are emanations of enlightened beings. For example, four-faced Mahakala is considered an emanation of Manjushri. Six Arm Mahakala is considered an emanation of Avalokiteshvara or Kuan Yin. Um, you have uh, protectors that are emanations of Ajapani, of Samanda Bhadra, of um, various enlightened beings. So those we don't have to even think about. They're enlightened beings, their energy is enlightened, and the enlightened energy is direct, it's positive, it's very obvious. Then you have unenlightened beings. Within the category of unenlightened beings that are Dharma protectors, you have two types. One is they are actually enlightened, manifesting as an unenlightened being. And then you have actually unenlightened beings who have been um, sworn of allegiance to a high lama to benefit others who are not enlightened. So you have enlightened beings who are emanations of actually Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. That's one category. Then the next category of protectors is, are unenlightened beings. And within the category of unenlightened beings, you have two types. One is, in, is protectors that manifest as ordinary uh, beings, but they're actually emanations of enlightened beings. Then you have protectors that are ordinary beings who are not enlightened, who have been bound or sworn of allegiance to allegiance to assist people. All right? So today, I would like to talk about an enlightened being taking on the form of both enlightened and unenlightened um, manifestations. When I was, I'm, I am um, 53 years old this year, 
And when I was 18, I was in Los Angeles and I was extremely lucky because I lived in a Dharma center for eight years and studied with a very venerable, erudite, compassionate, and humble master. And that is um, His Eminence, Geshe Tsurum Gelson. So I had left home in New Jersey when I was 15, and I hitchhiked across the country, and I came to Los Angeles. And when I arrived in Los Angeles, I stayed at a cousin's house for a few months, and then I moved to the inner city, and then um, I found the Dharma Center, which was, um, the teacher was Geshe Tsurum Gelson. And so when I joined the center, I was 15 going on 16, and I lived in the center until I was 22, 23, where I proceeded to India to become a monk. So those eight years of my life while I was growing up, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, around 23, um, I lived with Geshe I lived with Geshe Tsurum Gelson in a room downstairs that I rented from the Dharma Center, and Geshe lived upstairs, and I studied with him. He taught me rituals. He passed me oral transmissions. Um, every Sunday we had Lamrim and, uh, and sometimes Tantra classes. And also he gave explanations and commentaries. And it was such a beautiful time because I had the great honor and privilege to also serve Geshe because people living in the center was just about three of us. And I had the great honor to sometimes cook for Geshe to do his laundry on a regular basis to clean his room, to vacuum his carpet, to straighten out his um, living area, um, to sometimes even be his secretary when he had visitors to, you know, assist him to see him, write notes, um, sometimes read some of his letters and bills. And um, sometimes when he went out to teach or went for blessings, I would accompany him, carry his things. So I had the great honor to serve my teacher for that time for about eight years. And I learned quite a lot from him, quite a lot. And his teacher, he has a few teachers that are very great masters of Tibet, the top of the top. And one of his teachers was His Holiness Kebji Sarumchi. And Geshe had invited Kebji Sarumchi to Los Angeles to stay in our center. And um, I was really excited because the minute I heard Sarumchi's name, it felt right, it felt special, it felt connected, it felt like I should know this person, that this person is for me. It's something I can't explain because I was very young. And I remember riding in a car with a fellow Dharma student. I was going to talk, and he had a picture of Saramchi on his dashboard of his car, a 3R size, 3R, three, three, three by 2 inch. And I asked, who's that? And he says, that's Saramji, that's Geshe's teacher. And I went, wow. And then this man told me that Saramji is actually the emanation of Hiruka. And I went, wow, double wow. And so I asked him, can I have that picture? And he gave it to me. So the minute I got that picture, I placed the picture of Saramji on my shrine. And every single day I did 100 prostrations to Saramji and prayed that I can get teachings from him, that I can be near him, that I can receive initiations and lineages, and that I wish him to be my guru. And it was automatic, it was natural. So I did 100 prostrations to the picture of Captain Saramchi. And lo and behold, a year, within that year, year and a half, we were told that Geshe invited Saramchi to Los Angeles, to our center, to Dundajling, and he's going to stay with us for six months. I was very excited. There was a flurry of cleaning, light renovations, painting, preparations, instructions from Geshe And um, when Saramchi finally came, Geshe Geshe Tsurum Gelson personally selected me to be Saramji's assistant. His cook, I wasn't a great cook, but I was his cook. Um, the person to clean his room, the person to vacuum, the person to straighten out his room, the person to attend to him personally. And I had that great honor. And so I was very lucky to get close to Saramji physically and be with him and always be in a room with him. Even when he talked to people, when he spoke to people, when he did teachings, I was always there. Um, and to make a long story short, at that time, at that time, I had asked Saramji 
that I would like to do one protective practice for the rest of my life. Because I have a lot of obstacles to my life. Getting a job, you know, I'm fin financially strapped and I get sick often and I just have obstacles. I think all of us do. But I know that in Tibetan Buddhism, there's a way to overcome these obstacles with very powerful spiritual beings called protectors. And so when I asked Saramji who should be my protector, I said that I like Pelnun Hamo, I like Dorji Shukdin, because Dorji Shukdin was introduced to me by Geshe Tsudam Gelsen. And Dorji Shukdin has shown me a lot, a lot of signs. The first time I was trying to get a job, I was 15, 16, not qualified. I dropped out of school and I needed to make money. I, I was applying for jobs and I mean, how, how many jobs can I get being that age and zero qualifications? So I went, so I applied for a job and I didn't know if I'd get hired. If I didn't get hired, I wouldn't be able to pay my bill. If I couldn't pay my bill, I couldn't stay in the Dharma Center. And I really wanted to stay in the Dharma Center with Geshe-la. So I went to geshe and told him my dilemma how I've been applying for jobs and I can't get any jobs and it's been weeks and I really need this job so I can stay in the center. And Geshla was doing his meditations and he had a tanka. A tanka is a Tibetan brocade painting of various spiritual beings, of Buddhas. He had a tanka of Dorji Shugnin in his room and he pointed to the tanka and he, he said, this is Dhammapala. If you want your job and you trust him, if you pray to him and you request him, you will get your job. And I just said, really? Because I mean, you know, I, I believe everything Yeshua tells me. He's my, he's my teacher. So I immediately prostrated to the tanka, to the brocade painting in Dodi Shigen, and I requested him. And I said, I'd like to live here with Yeshua, and I wish to serve and learn with Yeshua. Please help me get this job so that I can pay my bills here. Because our center is very poor. We need to pay mortgage. Please help me to get this job. And you know what? Within two days, I got a call. And out of all the candidates, I got the job. And the job was very stable. And that was the first sign that Dorji Shudin has shown me. And I ran to Geshe-la and told him what happened. And geshe -la said, very good, very good. I told you Dorji Shudin would help you. And that was my first experience with Dorji Shudin as a 16-year-old child in Los Angeles who needed a job to support himself because I wasn't living with my family and I wasn't getting any financial support and I had no money at all. So... Fast forward, when Kevin Saramji came to the center, I was 18 years old. He stayed at the center and I was in his room with him. And I asked him to please assign me a Dharma protector. I liked a few like Benin Hamo, Doji Shukdin, etc. And can he assign one to me? And I will protect, I will pray and hold that protector for the rest of my life without deviating. And so Saramji said to me simply, he looked at me and said to me, if you want, I will give you my personal protector. Well, very simple. If it's good enough for His Holiness Kebji Saramji, it would be more than good enough for me because I am nowhere near Kebji Saramji's caliber. And so I said to Kebji Saramji, I folded my hands, please initiate me and grant me the blessings of your protector and permission to practice. Please, Kepji Saramji, grant me the permission and the transmission to practice your personal protector. And I was so excited, I didn't ask who his personal protector was. So then he says, okay, good night. So I ran to the other room, I told Geshe I was jumping up and down like a kid at Christmas. You know, Christmas Eve presents are exciting. I was jumping up and down like a kid at Christmas, saying to Geshe-la, Saramji is going to give me his personal protector. Saramji is going to give me his personal protector. And geshe -la looked at me and shot me one question. Which one is that? I said, oh, um, I don't know. <laughs> so geshe -la says he's going to give you, he says Saramji has a few personal protectors because he's a great lama. And I said, oh. So I, I, I ran back to Saramji's room, opened up the little curtain, and he was asleep. It was dark. And I said, oh, dear. And being the impatient person that I, I have always been, I couldn't sleep the whole night. I couldn't, I, I was thinking, which one is it? So I went to Geshla, lucky Geshla was still up, and I said, which one do you think it is? Geshla says, maybe it's Dorji Shukden, maybe it's Setra, maybe it's Four Face Makala. I don't know, you're going to have to ask Sarmji yourself. But I think it's Dorji Shukden. And so that night I thought, hmm, who is going to be?
Who is it going to be? Who is it going to be? It's like a kid at Christmas. You shake that box that's under the tree. You wonder, what is it? What kind of talk is it? And so when I got up the next day, I, I made breakfast for Saranji as I'd done every single day. He likes toast with some butter and a little bit of jam, a slice of cheese and an egg and another slice of toast and it's cut in half. He likes that sweet and sour taste with a cup of tea. Um, that's what he ate every day for breakfast, every single day. So I brought up his breakfast on a tray with tea and all that. And then I said to him, which protector are you going to give me, your holiness? And he looked at me and laughed. He says, I'm not going to give you a protector. I said, but you promised. He says, okay, I'll give it to you. He used to play with me like a little kid. He was very affectionate. He said, I'm going to give you Doji Shugden. I was so excited. I wasn't really excited that it was Doji Shugden. I was excited that Saramchi is assigning me a protector. I repeat, I wasn't so excited that it was Doji Shugden. I was excited that it was Saramji himself assigning me a protector. One of the greatest lamas that Tibet has ever produced is going to assign me a personal protector. And this lama, who is the Buddha himself, who is clairvoyant, who is tantrically advanced, who is an erudite master, who is a great geshe, who is an abbot of the monastery, who is just a, the guru of thousands and thousands of other masters, is going to assign me a personal protector. So I just, I was so excited. So after about two, three weeks, with along with another 70 or 80 persons from our center, three persons at a time, three persons at a time, according to the rituals of this protector, we were initiated into the practice of Doji Shukden. So Kabji Saramji initiated myself and gave me the commitment chakra, Sokor, and the commitment crystal, and he became my protector. So the commitment is, until I reach full enlightenment, I will practice to protect this protector, Doji Shiden, as my principal protector. And Doji Shiden will assist me life after life until, until I achieve bodhicitta. So Doji Shiden's commitment to me is to achieve, to help me until I achieve bodhicitta. And my commitment to him is hold him as my principal protector. And this was done by Kebja Saramji. That's what the guru does. The guru introduces you to these spiritual beings. And from that day four till now, it's been over 30 years, I've helped Keb I have helped Doji Shuten as my principal protector. I think, and Kebja Saramji himself told us, told me that Doji Shuten is Manjushri. Doji Shukin is one of the eight principal disciples of Buddha Shakyamuni himself, the historical, the enlightened, the one and only sage of all sages, Buddha Shakyamuni. So as a Buddhist, we all take refuge in Shakyamuni. We all trust and believe in Shakyamuni and we follow Buddha Shakyamuni's teachings or the interpretations of his teachings by great masters, such as Tsongkhapa. So, I have been practicing Doji Shukin doing his pujas, his commitment and prayers for the last 30 years. Um, and the commitment to Doji Shudin is, is a very simple yet profound, which is to have guru devotion, to not harm other beings, to work as hard as I can to be a benefit to other beings, and to never disparage the Dharma, whether it's Gilukpa, Nima, Sakya, uh, Gagyu, Hinayana, Mahayana, Japanese, Thai Buddhism, Cambodian Buddhism, whatever Buddhism it is, it is never to disparage another form of Buddhism. And there was no commitments to us that, oh, we can't um, read about or investigate other lineages, other practices, other schools of Buddhism. But we were encouraged to practice and to understand our own form, our own school of Buddhism, and to master that, because that would be more than enough. And that was encouraged that everybody should master their own form of Buddhism, their own school of Buddhism. But there was nothing like, oh, you can't read, you can't read um, books by other schools of Buddhism or other teachers, or you can't practice other things. There's no such thing. Saranchi didn't give such um, commitments. The commitment was to have very strong Guru devotion, 
to work very hard to benefit others, to develop bodhicitta, not to harm other people, and to hold Doroshina as our principal protector. So the commitment is that, and every single month we do a special puja Doroshina, which takes about, if you do it quickly, it takes about two and a half hours with special offerings. If you're not able to do it or you're not well, you can have other people do it for you. And so I received the, in, the sokte or the transmission, the permission to practice, the oral transmission from Kaji Saramji. And it was Kaji Saramji's instruction to me to practice Doji Shukden. So I am practicing Doji Shukden because I am following Kaji Saramji's instructions from 1988, isn't it? Where I met Saramji. 83, sorry, I always get it mixed up. I am practicing Kebja Saramchi's instructions from 1983, when I was 18, when I met Kebja Saramchi. I repeat, when I met Kebja Saramchi, I was 18 years old, 1983. So that's when he gave it to me. That's over 30 years. I don't practice Dorji Shugen for political reasons or, or monetary reasons. I don't even know how you can practice it for monetary reasons. But I don't practice it for any reason except it is assigned by my guru. I have other meditations and other uh, prayers that I have to do daily that I've done for 30 years that's assigned to me by Saramji also. For example, one of the prayers I must do, one of the prayers I must do is um, the recitation of the Avalokiteshvara Mantra. So I've done that every single day for 30 years, plus without a break, without missing it. That's an assignment from Kem Saramji. And there are many other practices that I have to do daily. So, Doji Shukdin is not important. Saramji is important. My guru is important. So if he assigns that to me, then I have to do it. So I practice Doji Shukdin and I share it with others. And by sharing it with me, I will share it with others. And he understands that. Somebody shared it with Saramji. His guru shared it with him. And then therefore he shared it with me. So if I have students or friends, I will share it with others. Just as example, Saramji showed me. So therefore, Doji Shukdin Saramji said, in a nutshell, he's Manjushri, emanated in a form of a protector that is within samsara's bounds, that is able to help us, that is near us, that is able to hear us and talk to, uh, hear us and guide us and bless us. Kensur Jamba Yeshi, the great abbot of Gandhinshati Monastery, I asked him also, who is Doji Shukdan? What is his nature? Kensur Rinpoche Jason Jamba Yeshi of Ganden Shatsi Monastery, who is my philosophical teacher in Ganden, also told me he's Manjushri. Simple as that, he's Manjushri. Then there's a great master named Gen Nima, who is a hermit and a meditator of Ganden Jangse Monastery. And I asked him once, who is Doji Shudin? He told me Doji Shudin is a Buddha. It is Manjushri. Same. I have posed the question to Kabji Lati Rinpoche. Who is Manjushri? Kebji Lati Rumchi of Gandhin Shatse also told me it is Doji Shukdin. And so on and so on and so on. Manjushri is Doji Shukdin. Doji Shukdin is Manjushri. There's no difference. In fact, Kebji Lati Rumchi encouraged my practice of Doji Shukdin. If I had some problems or issues, Kebji Lati Rumchi told me to write it down in a letter and put it in Gandhin Shatse's Doji Shukdin chapel under the statue of Doji Shukdin. He used to tell me to do that. He encouraged it. He would tell me to do Doji Shukdin pujas. Lati Umchi himself would tell me that. In fact, Lati Umchi is the one that asked me to go to Malaysia to teach many years back. So, um, all these years I've been doing, do I've been doing Doji Shukdin's practice out of respect and my promise and commitment to my guru, Kajasar Umchi. Kajasar Umchi is my root guru, is my root teacher. So, if Saramji gives me the Doji Shukdin practice, then I have to practice it. The only way I can stop doing Doji Shukdin's practice, not that I want to stop, is if I go to Saramji and I ask him, may I stop doing it? And he says, yes, you may. Then I can stop. Or if he tells me, you stop, then I can stop. No other guru, authority, or master, can override my root guru's instructions to me. My root guru's instructions to me is my personal relationship with my guru. And no one can interfere and no one can obstruct or override that. So another monk, another nun, another master, another meditator, as great as they can be, cannot come and tell me, according to the rules of guru devotion, that you must stop Doji Shukdin. 
without me receiving permission from Saramji. So, Saramji has passed away, so there is no way I can ask his permission to stop the practice if I wanted to, which I don't. So, no one on this planet now can override Captain Saramji's instructions. And also, according to the senior lamas, even if your lama has an incarnation, a young incarnation, even that incarnation do not necessarily have the authority to override the instruction given by his previous life to yourself. That's what the Geshis and senior lamas of Ganden told me. So, my commitment and Samaya, Samaya is my spiritual relationship with my teacher. Samaya is spiritual relationship with my teacher. It's between me and my teacher and no one can override that. So I have to continue doing the Ojishin practice and that's the practice I have to share with others because that's what it's been assigned to me. So my practice of Dojishudin is fulfilling my commitment to Dojishudin. It's nothing more than that. It's never been more than that. It's always been that. It's always been nothing but that. Fulfilling the commitments of my root teacher, Kebja Saramji. Kebja Saramji is my root teacher, is my root guru, is the love of my life, is the person I have great faith in, that I have great trust in, who has passed me many initiations, lineages, oral transmissions, commentaries. He has been very kind to me. When I was in Gandhishatse, I lived in Saramji's house. I ate Saramji's food. I lived on Saramji's land. I used Saramji's property. He is my teacher. He is my spiritual father. So I don't know how much more I need to explain. I think you understand. So in any case, if Saramji assigns this practice, which was assigned by his teacher and his teacher and his teacher, and it's been going on for 350 years, we know this practice is very powerful. And so this practice was practiced by Thousands of great masters and ordinary people in Tibet, Mongolia, Nepal, India, Kalmyk, Russia, and all those places. Because you can find those Shiddin literature, practice, all over the place. Tankas, images, statues, all over the place, which I have found. 